Evangelical Church's evening worship service where we worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh, welcome to Ian. He'll be bringing God's word to us later. Grace. You notice us before we get cracking. Uh, just a, a reminder that there is an opportunity to serve by cleaning the church this uh, Tuesday evening, seven and nine. Able, uh, come along, help out there. Various uh, things are back in in play this week, but there isn't a good news club. Um, uh, and just again, the the mem- uh, the the prayer meeting, uh, we've got Cornerstone coming, which is a uh, at the only Christian. Uh, adoption uh, uh, agency uh, in the UK. Uh, so uh, they're going to come and share some things about what they do. Uh, it'd be great if you could come and we could be praying for them. Uh, a few of our just advance notices. We've got our, our members meeting on the 8th of May. Our members, put that in your diaries. And then uh, a couple of church days out, 18th of May at Cannon Hall. And I haven't got dates here, so I'm, is it the 13th of July? That sounds right, doesn't it, uh, for Whitby? Uh, so uh, just put that in your diary. Uh, everything else on the Friday email, if you don't get a Friday email, you'd like to receive one, uh, let me know. Or um, uh, you can fill in the contacts page you know, on, on the website, and that might do it for you. Although having said that, Hannah is the one that then sorts things out, and she's away for a month, so things might be s- slowed down if you, if you do want to... Uh, get in contact and be part of the mailing list. Um, shall we sing, shall we? What, what, it's, it's such a great pleasure and delight to sing praises to our triune God. And so let's sing, All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you. Let's stand to sing, shall we?
sits. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we sing that last line, I love you, Lord. May it be true. And as we sing it, we know that we only love you because you first loved us. We praise you and we thank you for your amazing love. We praise you and thank you for a love that stretches down, that stoops down. A love that is seen in service, a love that is seen in sacrifice, a love that is seen in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A love that goes to the cross for us. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son. You gave your one and only son. And Lord, we thank you that we can look to your love and we know that that is an unfailing love, a steadfast love. Lord, we thank you that you are a faithful God. And Lord, we, we thank you that we can come to you sure of your faithfulness, Lord, in a, in a world where, there's, uh, where love is so cheap, uh, where faithfulness is so cheap. We thank you that you are a faithful God and you, your love endures forever. Lord, we thank you that we can ha put our trust and our hope and our love in you. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us to love you more. Lord, we, we pray that our love for you would grow. Lord, that you would stir in us a, a love that desires to spend time with you, a desire to, to seek you in, in your presence, in, in prayer, in reading your word, in, in coming together and, and joining together on Sundays. Lord, even a love that uh, means that we want to meet up with one another and discuss the Bible with one another because we, we love you that much, Lord. We pray that you would give us that kind of love. Lord, and in that, help us to know you better. Help us to grow in Christ and help us to go and make more disciples. As we were thinking this morning, Lord, we pray that you would help us to love your mission, to care about seeing people saved and, and care about seeing people grow up in their salvation. Lord, we pray that that would uh, always be at the forefront of our minds. But as we, we seek to love you, as we seek to love your mission, help us also to, to love one another. Lord, we thank you again that in Christ we see the greatest example. Lord, we thank you of his servant-hearted nature, Lord. We thank you that we see what loving service looks like. And Lord, in some small way, help us by the power of your spirit to emulate that. So that maybe the people around us, Dewsbury and, and the people in Dewsbury would see uh, that love in action. Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to be a, a light on a hill, a, a light to the a light of the world, a light to the nations, as it were. Lord, that you would show us and help us, Lord, to be a, a faithful church, loving you and loving one another, but also a church that loves Dewsbury. That we would care for the lost here, that you would give us compassion for the lost here. And again, we thank you and we praise you that we can see what wonderful compassion in you, the triune God, and, and in Jesus Christ as he walked this earth. Lord, we thank you that in you, there, you have salvation. You are the one that is, holds salvation. You are the one that is, holds forgiveness. And that is because of your great love to us. So once again, we praise you and we thank you. And help us, Lord, this evening. Would you give us... Uh, a, a desire to learn, a desire to, to grow, a desire to, to know you as we learn from your word. Lord, be with Ian. We thank you that he's coming this evening and, and bringing your word. Lord, we thank you for Grace Church Wakefield. And, and Lord, we, we pray for them. We pray that you would encourage them. You would help them to see fruit. Help them, Lord, to see enough workers to join the harvest field so that they can plant in Eastmore. Lord, we pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them in the faith. 
and you would build us all up so that we might be conformed into the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's read uh, God's words. Uh, I mentioned this morning that in God's providence, uh, Ian will be looking at a, 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 a little bit of Isaiah 49. He'll be um, focusing mainly on verses 15 to 16, but we're going to read verses 1 to 16 of Isaiah 49. We, we just touched upon a little bit verse 6 this morning. Uh, what a wonderful passage it is. Isaiah 49, and from verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring, back, bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says, in the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from north, some from west, some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Amen. Well, before Ian comes to preach, God's words to us. Uh, let's sing again a, a hymn uh, that is a prayer. Uh, we can sing it as a prayer, uh, but it's also singing truth. God has spoken by his prophets. We've just read the prophet Isaiah, and then we can sing in truth. God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging world, word, each from age to age proclaiming God the one, the righteous Lord. Let's stand and sing, shall we?
great to be with you. Thanks for the invite, Mark. And uh, I, I think it would be especially helpful if you could see Isaiah 49 on the page. Um, I think you'll be able to uh, get a sort of a, a better sense of what's, what's going on here. Um, what we get here are promises given by God to people who believe them but they don't feel them. That's what we get here. And that's an experience, of course, common to nearly all, all Christian believers at some point or another. Um, in a, even in a gathering this, this size, there'll be people like that tonight who believe these things, believe the gospel promises we've been praying in response to and singing to one another and to God, um, or perhaps as young people here who have been brought up in a Christian home, as they're called, and uh, um, in a sense kind of believe the gospel all their life, been brought up to believe it and do believe it, and yet may not feel it, may not feel it, especially, especially when things are difficult. What we get then is... Um, Verses 1 to 13, we get God's word, God's promise, so God's gospel promises. In verse 14, we get the hard question. And then in verses 15 to 16, we get a healing answer. The gospel promises, a hard question, verse 14, and the healing answer. So first of all, gospel promises. Gospel literally means, I'm sure many of you know this, literally means, of course, good news. And Isaiah is um, ministering good news to the Israelites whom he spoke to in the city of Jerusalem and the surrounds about 700 years before Jesus came. And uh, it's a bit confusing in the book of Isaiah because sometimes you're, you, the, the bit we're at here actually it, it, through Isaiah, God is speaking to people who are captives in Babylon. But at the time that Isaiah was speaking, the, these captives were not in Babylon. They weren't even captives. They were people happily living their lives in the city of Jerusalem. It's a long book, Isaiah, and it's sort of in your, conceptually, it covers a long, sort of long period of time. Uh, so here he is, he is speaking. At this point, he is thinking ahead to when the Israelites are taken by the Babylonians into captivity in Babylon, far, far, far away um, from their home in Jerusalem. And not only that, their home, their city, Jerusalem, is going to be wiped off the map, more or less. The Babylonians are pretty destruct destructive characters and they would smash the thing to smithereens and take the people away most of them into what we call exile. Um, lots of bits of the Bible pick up on that time in the history of the people of Israel. Psalm 137 always comes to my, to my mind, probably because of the song from the 70s. Not that I'm old enough, but by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept. Now, of course, this would be a tragedy, but it'd be, it'd be a tragedy for any, any, any nation, any people group, wouldn't it, to, to have your home destroyed and be taken off into, into captivity. Um, we see nation, we're seeing one unfold before our very, well, our eyes on the TV screens and your phones as you see what's happening in, uh, in Palestine, don't you? I mean, this, history is littered with this sort of thing. Nations, small nations being sort of swallowed up and destroyed by bigger ones. Why is this one any different? Why is this one more important? Well, because the Bible... The reason the Bible focuses in on this tragedy is because the Israelites had received from God very great and very precious promises. They were to be specifically and especially his of all the nations of the earth. They were going to be his, his little nation of Israel. And they were supposed to live these spiritually, emotionally rich as well as physically rich a land flowing with milk and honey 
you know, these happy lives and protected by God, kept safe by him in their very own land. But um, apart from the odd exception, they, they never did really love him, did they? They, um, generally speaking, um, as a nation, they didn't love him. They just did everything they could to try to disobey him in the end. Um, and so eventually, and it is eventually, after much patience and much warning from God, God has to, in order for his justice to be upheld, he has to judge the Israelites, these people that he loves so deeply that he called to be his very own of all the nations of the earth. He has to judge them. And that is in the form of the Babylonians coming, taking them into exile and destroying the precious city of Jerusalem. Now imagine, put yourself in their shoes if you can. A long time ago, um, 2,700 years, imagine the tragedy, imagine the pain, imagine the sense also of being abandoned by God, that those promises he'd made to you um, and your children and your friend's children and their children and the children, your, your whole nation. Imagine the sense of pointlessness to life. How can we even carry on? Maybe you're thinking that sometimes in your life. How can I keep going? Um, but this is an extraordinary thing for any of you. What we're going to see here is an extraordinary thing for any of you who feel like that or any of you who perhaps think, you know, there's too much water gone under the bridge with God. Um, yes, I, I believe in him, I suppose. But he feels very far off. Um, perhaps that's your experience, but it isn't with God. There is always hope. And there was hope for these Babylonian captives, well, these captives in Babylon, because Isaiah says to them, there's a servant coming. A servant is coming, a servant of God, who will sort everything out for you. He'll sort everything out. He'll heal everything. He's going to put everything right. All the bad is going to be undone and rewound and life will be great. It'll be even better than, I, than it's ever, be, ever been before for you and your people. Verses 1 to 7. This is why, so the, if you have it open, you can sort of map this out. You can see it. Verses 1 to 7. This, this servant of God is the one who speaks. This servant speaks. And this servant who's going to sort everything out, put everything right, undo all the wrong. And bring everything good. Um, in verse 1, the servant says, Before I was born, the Lord called me. Before I was born, the Lord called me. And the question people often ask is, Well, who is this servant? Is it Isaiah himself, the prophet? Well, let's keep going. I mean, let's keep investigating. Because in verse 3, we find out that the prophet is a servant, a servant named um, Israel. But this servant called Israel, because you could say, oh, okay, the servant of God is the people of God. These are captives in Babylon. But, but the problem with that is, if you see in, um, in verse 6, this servant who is called Israel, he's going to call back the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. So it can't be the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel can't say the nation of Israel. Um, it's an individual who is going to bring the people back to God and restore everything. It goes bigger than just restoring the people of Israel to God. It's the Gentiles as well. I guess most of us here are what the Bible would call Gentiles, people who are not Jews, not um, Israelites by birth. And you see in um, this servant, what, what's his servant going to be at the end of verse 6? I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation, this rescue, putting everything right again, may reach to the end of the earth. You see, it's going to be bigger, going to be better than it ever was before. Much wider. So there's this servant of God who is going to come. And um, verses 8 to 13, and of course, you all, if you've been around the block a little bit, you know, well, we know that the servant Isaiah speaks about is Jesus. And of course, that's what the New Testament writers understood this to be. He said, Jesus understood himself to be. The servant is Jesus Christ. Verses 8 to 13, 
we, we see what God is going to accomplish through this servant. Um, there's going to be a new covenant in verse 8. It doesn't say a new covenant there. I, be, I will make you a covenant to be a covenant for the people. Now, they were used to the idea of a covenant, a sort of a legally binding deal between them and God. Um, the one that uh, Moses um, brought, brought about, or God through Moses brought about. The, uh, the, 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 the law of God given on uh, Mount Sinai. Obey these laws and you will live in my land forever. Disobey and you won't. There's going to be a new deal, a new arrangement, a new covenant, you see in verse 8. In fact, this servant himself is going to be a covenant, which is strange thing to say, isn't it? How can a person be a deal, be a, an arrangement between two parties? The people who are captive in Babylon, these captives, are going to be set free in verse 9. That's the thing they really want. By the rivers of Babylon, they sat down and wept. Well, they're going to be set, no more weeping. Up you get, boys and girls. Back, you, you, you're free. You're free to leave. And they're on their journey back to the place where God is, back to Jerusalem. Um, you see, it's going to be a, a journey where they are able to feed on the roadside. Now, Lydia and her mum were, were in Norfolk recently. And Lydia said that on all these country roads around Norfolk, you sort of, you see quite a lot of, of roadkill by the side, of the, you know, by the side of the, the A roads and the, the dual carriageways and stuff, and, you know, badgers and foxes and... Uh, you know, pheasants and what have you. Is that, is that what the Israelite captives of the return from Babylon to Jerusalem, is that what they're going to have to eat? Is it, is it, is it, is it, we, we read this and think that doesn't sound too good eating by side the roadside. But the picture is actually, the point is that there is just an abundance of food. There's just so much food that as you walk along the road, there's just food. Now we're used to that because as we go along the road, it seems that every square inch has been taken over by McDonald's or KFC. It doesn't seem that strange to us. But for people who were like subsistence farmers or whatever, they needed, they, good, this, this sounds incredible. We'll eat by the side of the road. Verse 10, again, it's not a picture that will immediately sort of um, uh, hit us between the eyes, but nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. But if you lived in an arid country where the sun did beat down on you, you would know that the sun was a killer. And that the... You, in this, on this journey back, the long journey, the journey, well, I think it's something like 450 miles Babylon to Jerusalem, but I think you would have to go technically along rivers, so it's something like 1,700 miles, so it's a very long journey. You would be protected from the heat. God's going to protect you from the heat. You'll be safe on this journey back to Jerusalem. Verse 11, remember this is this journey back to God, back to everything being great again. Um, Verse 11, the mountain, mountains are going to be turned into roads. Well, mountains are tricky to get over, aren't they? If you ever try to get over a, over a mountain, either a, uh, any sort of form of transport, they, you know, they, they, they take hard work, they're hard work. But God is going to turn the mountains into roads. Again, it's not so strange for us, I suppose, because of the, the motorway age, sort of ploughing six lanes through the Pennines or what have you. But the idea of crossing mountains, vast numbers of people crossing mountains seems, would, would seem incredible. But God is going to, it's a metaphor, folks. You know, don't, don't ring Greenpeace after this. The point is that he's going to make the journey back to Jerusalem very easy, straightforward. Before the motorway age, I imagine if you wanted to go to the deepest sort of corners of the UK or all the trunk roads, it was a difficult journey. But as long as the motorways are running nicely, it's, it's a breeze, isn't it, to get around the country? It's a breeze. So it's going to be so easy for the captives to get back. And in verse 12, you see how it goes bigger than just the Israelites coming back to this rich experience of, of living under God's rule and reign, enjoying his goodness, enjoying his favour, enjoying a life of plenty and of peace. It's not just the people of Israel. They're going to come from all over, from the north. Verse 12, from the west, some from the region of Aswan. Yeah, I thought the same. I didn't know where Aswan was, but apparently it's in the, in the very bottom of Egypt. And it might be the case that that was as far as Isaiah sort of knew. I wonder what's the furthest place away that you know. Isaiah knew Aswan. Even from Aswan, they're going to come. Even from Dewsbury. Even from Wakefield. This, this is a stunning picture. It's a stunning picture. This is the gospel 
in the Old Testament. It's a picture of salvation. And you see, because it's, it's not just bringing the Israelites back to where they were before, is it? All the language, everything Isaiah is saying is, is sort of, is going to burst out of that. It's much bigger. It's greater than what the Israelites knew before when they lived in the land under Solomon and David previously, when things were pretty good. This is, this is bigger and greater. This is a stunning picture. And what should happen is they and we should read it, meditate upon it, and be amazed by it. We should be thrilled. We should feel it. That's what Isaiah expects. So we have this great, great salvation is coming. And so what should happen is, well, even, even the very creation itself should rejoice. Verse 13, shout for joy, you heavens, the, the, the stars, the moon, the sun. You shout for joy. Rejoice, you earth. A bit blow, but we stood on. Burst into song, you mountains. See, they're still there. Not yet been turned into motorways. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Wow, 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 wow. This is amazing. This comfort for these afflicted Israelites. In fact, we're in a section of Isaiah that begins, I think in chapter 40, doesn't it? With comfort. The words comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Words of comfort. Time to rejoice. It's like all your Christmases, all your Christmas wish lists rolled into one big wish list and getting it all and with some sugar on the top. Now, the, the point is um, you put yourselves in the shoes of these Israelites in Babylon in captivity. And I mean, um, well, we might struggle with trying to do that, but you can think about your own situation. Some of you here tonight and some of the people that you know and love in the church um, are going through things that are tough, hard times. Um, these Israelites are living in Babylon, far from home. Life's difficult. Life seems hopeless. They have, they have very little things, but they have a lot of fears and worries about the present and about the future for them, for their children, next generation and beyond. There's all sorts of things that weigh them down. The promises of God seem to have been abandoned. What they have is God's word. What do they have? As they sat by the rivers of Babylon and wept, they had God's word. They'll look around at their life. They'll look at their circumstances and they'll say, this is bleak. This is rubbish working for the Babylonians. We can't, you know, we, we, what future is there for us here? This is tough. So very hard. What they had was God's word. Your experience, your life, if you're not going through a hard time now, you will do. We will, won't we, eventually? We will go through a hard time. Because I'm... Looking around the room, because I know most of you, but I'm, I'm sorry to, if it is the case that someone misled you and told you that um, being a Christian would sort out all your problems. Everything would be great. Of course, that's not the case. In fact, being a Christian, in some sense, it just makes everything a lot harder. Um, you have all the things that were common to all human experience, you know, redundancy, ill health, relationship difficulties, all sorts of temptations um, in life. Um, so we have negative things and we have too much of the good things, which sort of they become a heavy load to bear and they can be destructive. And on top of that, now you've become a Christian, you put yourself in a minority group. In the UK, it's not too hard being a Christian in the minority group, not compared with some of our brothers and sisters around the world, but you know, You've put yourself in a minority group. Things aren't going to be as straightforward as they once were. Um, now, that's not the whole story. There is a way of telling the story that the Christian life really is the best life it could possibly be. Life really is fantastic as a Christian. Depends how you want to sort of tell the story. Both sides have true. The truth in it, both are true. What we have when we find things are hard is we have promises from the Bible. We have God's word. We have his word that our sins are are forgiven that we have received his holy spirit and have been adopted as his sons and daughters we have the promise of eternal resurrection life and that sort of thing we have god's word on it we have his word it's it's my word i give you my word true even if you don't feel like it it's true he says and when things are i mean they're hard enough to sometimes believe when you don't 
but things are all right. I mean, things are tough. You can think, well, they really seem hard to believe. And I certainly don't feel them. I don't feel any joy. So let's move on to that, that sort of thing. So the secondly, the hard question, um, what it's like. Here's what it's like perhaps for you when it's very tough and you have God's promises. And tough can be tough, but tough can just be life's just a bit. And life is tough. This world is tough. Why we need salvation? Why we need a whole new creation or renewed creation? It's hard, these, God's word, his gospel word is hard to believe. You don't feel it. You, you, it can be extraordinarily tough at times. And you know, um, well, I mean, you, there's cancer, isn't there? Or all sorts of ill health. There's relationship struggles. There's someone you love is dying. And, and whatever it is, well, it's just the, 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 the humdrum, the weight of the humdrum. And the, all of that, the, the promises seem silent to you. You have this promise, you have this word. It was made long, 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 a long time ago. Now, I don't know, have you felt like this? Have you felt like that? These promises, I believe them, but I'm not sure I really feel them. And you just feel a bit flat and you're going through the motions. Um, and it can feel like, even though you're, you're here perhaps tonight, it can feel like God is a million miles away. Well, that is how the Israelites in Babylon felt when they received these incredible promises from God, spectacular promises from God. They get the gospel given to them. But in verse 14, Zion said, so Zion is sort of the mountain near, Jer Mount near Jerusalem that's sort of synonymous with Jerusalem, but the people of God. Zion said, no, nah, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten. Um, have you ever, those of you who are parents, have you ever forgotten your child? As in, not sort of momentarily, but maybe, yeah, but you left it behind somewhere. Um, Gwyneth, tonight is the night. Um, not to forget Lydia tonight, but there was a, there was a, Lydia tells me there was a time when she was left behind at a Jewsbury Evangelical Church on Kraken Edge Lane. Is that right? Sort of. She wasn't a child at that point, okay? So that doesn't make any difference. I mean, she's still your child. <laughs> a teenager. There we go. But you, you remember it, Gwyneth. There we go. Sailed home. Is Roy, Roy into his roast dinner? Is he? By the time the phone call came. Have you forgotten any, anything, Roy? No, I don't think so. I think the Yorkshire puddings are, are on their way. And uh, how about Lydia? I'm like, I don't know how it went, but anyway. This is what the Israelites feel like. God has forgotten them. Um, never mind these ancient promises that God is going to keep through this servant. Wow, goodness me, it all seems fanciful. Never mind this great rescue that's going to come and we have to be patient and all this. What about now? What about the present? God has forgotten us. He's left us behind. And he started on his roast dinner. He's left us behind. Now, when you or I, are at that point. We are spiritually speaking in a dangerous place because when we start to think that God has forgotten us, God has forsaken us, when you feel that God's a million miles away, what are you going to do? Won't God's love, won't God's commitment to you, won't God's thorough acceptance of you as his child in whom he delights is scenes feel so very far away what are you going to do how are you going to how are you going to fill the void and the danger is we start to look in other places wrong places unhealthy places bad places for that acceptance for that love that comfort that reassurance in places that will really harm us in places that could even take us away from god's love entirely and you know, we we think about well, what, what could that be? We haven't got time to explore that in much depth, I suppose. But broadly speaking, we think of money, material things. Jesus was frequently warning about the dangers of, of material wealth, wasn't he? Sex, alcohol and drugs. Could be burying yourself in work, couldn't it? Or burying yourself in your family. 
you know, that because these become the things that ultimately give you satisfaction and ultimate meaning and purpose. Good things like family even, you know, good things like work, good to have work, but to make them your ultimate things, the things that give you your deepest satisfaction and joy and comfort instead of God. And what happens then? You've, you've said, God's far away. I'll find my comfort secretly. No one knows about this. I'm actually finding my secret and my joy and my comfort in these other things, this, this, this different thing. I'm not telling anyone. I'm still here at church. But here's what I'm, here's what I'm doing. What's happening? You're just compounding the problem. Just making it worse. Because then you feel even further away from God. The more you do it. This terrible spiral, downward spiral develops. Verse 14, when Zion, the people of Israel, say, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord's forgotten me. On the one hand, it's a great encouragement to us because the Bible is saying it knows what it is like for us to feel. This is an inspired word of God. God is saying, I know how you feel. I know this is what you're thinking. I, I know how it works. That's a great encouragement. But don't just read over... Um, uh, you know, just don't just read over verse 14. Um, the Lord has forsaken, you know, don't just read verse 14 and think, oh, you know, oh, these poor Israelites, oh, you know, how sad, you know, perhaps even sort of a bit of a tear in your eyes, you think about it. Um, th these are people who deserve to be in Babylon, remember. These are people who are experiencing the judgment of God. And these are people who are in now in severe spiritual danger because they think God has completely forgotten, up, forgotten them and given up on them. What happens when the Lord's people are in this kind of danger? They're on the precipice. Yes, they're in Babylon. They're experiencing God's judgment, but it's all with a purpose to get them to come back to him, isn't it? That's always his purpose. But they're now at the place of saying, God's word isn't actually true. He's actually forgotten us, even though we're here. What what do you do? Well, what does God do? And let's, let's get on to this healing answer. Because we think, before we think about what we must do, we must think about what God does. Because it's extraordinary. Let's first of all see what God doesn't do. He doesn't sweep down to those Israelites who are um, in tears by the river of, rivers of Babylon and say, oh, okay, you feel like I've gone away from you. You feel, feel like I'm far away. Let's just get you out of here now. He doesn't do that. And there's nothing in the Bible to say that when you're going through real difficulties, real hardship, that God's just going to swoop right down and take you out of that moment, that experience, there and then, or anytime soon. He may not. Nothing in the Bible to say he's going to do that. You say, the Lord has forgotten me. And that starts to grip you. Um, there's nothing to say in the Bible that he's suddenly going to change your actual circumstances that you're in. What you have to do here is look, look what the Lord does. He speaks again. Remember, so verse 14, the Israelites have had their opportunity. God's forgotten us. God speaks. And you know, this is remarkably, extraordinarily gracious. These are people who deserve to be in Babylon. They deserve what they are getting because of their continual rebellion against God. God's, this is God's fair and just and right judgment upon them and yet he gives them chapter upon chapter and chapter of gospel promise through Isaiah it's wonderful promise and what they're going to receive he's saying is far better than even your ancestors experienced in their exodus from Egypt it's better than that and yet they still complain Lord you've forgotten us and they're like uh, you know makes me think a bit about teenage children and I've got one teenage child and we can sometimes feel very sorry for ourselves when we're teenage children but I was a teenage child once and I, that teenager lives on and they can feel very sorry you feel very you know these sorry like feeling very sorry for themselves what does the Lord do it's extraordinarily gracious listen to the tenderness of his response to these people doesn't change anything doesn't change their circumstances what he does is he presses into them he presses into them more deeply the reality of his love, the depth of his love for them. He gets hold of them and he massages it sort of deeper into their hearts. 
And he does it through this very powerful illustration, this very, very powerful picture that we get here. It's a good one. The illustration, the image is of that of possibly the strongest love the human race knows, that of a mother and her newborn child. Can, verse 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Literally the, the child that has come out of her own body. Um, I think we all know, apart from in very um, rare circumstances, like when they're teenagers and, you know, um, um, a mother and a child, especially a newborn child, the minute, the moment that little thing just murmurs, she's up. She's up. Is everything okay? What do they need? Is it a cuddle? Is it a nappy change? Is it, you know, is it food? Are they cold? Are they hot? What is it? The bloke is night. The bloke is bloke, the bloke is there. What's he doing? He's sort of sleeping through. Mother's going out of her mind with tiredness, but she's up to feed the baby. Can a mother forget? That's a picture. Sometimes we read the Bible and we just want to get through. Maybe you're doing a Bible reading plan. You want to get through it. Good. Get through lots of Bible. But sometimes you need to stop and think about what a picture means, what it's saying. I understand scientifically that it's almost, I mean, who am I to know? This is what someone has told me. Um, it's, it's scientifically impossible for a mother to forget her child because of the chemicals. Um, a breastfeeding mother, is her, her own body is literally telling her about her child. Don't forget it, don't forget it, don't forget it. Um, and apparently there's a whole lot of chemicals that get released when she, uh, when, when a mother um, sees her baby sleeping after a feed. There's this, you know, this wonderful, you, you might be absolutely kind of brain dead with tiredness, but there's a euphoria apparently. I mean, I've not, I've not done it. <laughs> Some of you will, will know the feeling perhaps. Or tell me after I'm talking rubbish. You see, but I think it's probably truth in it. And humanity changes and yet, well, it never changes. They knew this 2,700 years ago. We know it today. The, the, the strength, the incredible strength of the love that a mother has for a newborn child. What does God say? He says, my love for you, my love for you captives in Babylon who deserve to be where you are, who think that I've, I've given up on you. My love for you is greater even than that love. And so you Christian believers, us Christian believers, when, we, when God seems miles away and you're going through the motions and maybe you're tempted to go to other places for your comfort and you might do that in very socially acceptable ways. Not the alcohol and the drugs, no, but TV, holidays, um, family, work. God presses into you and he says, my love for you is greater than that of a mother for her newborn child. And he wants, what does he want? He surely he wants them to st stop and think about that and meditate upon it to press themselves in. Will you do that? Will you do that? Will you press yourself in to this image, this glorious image, this incredible image? Now, what this is telling you is that when God feels like he's far, far away, you have to slow down. This requires deep thinking. Um, let me say a little word on this. Sometimes when things are difficult, God seems far away. Um, one response is to say, well, maybe God isn't actually there. Um, plenty of people do that, don't they? When, when, when I suffer, where is God when I suffer? They, I'm suffering. God wouldn't allow this suffering if he's really there. It's a fair enough question. But um, the answer to the question, where is God? The answer, if the answer is, well, um, he's nowhere, so I'll just get rid of him. That's a, uh, dare I say, it's a, it's a pretty weak answer. It's a pretty pathetic answer. Because you've just traded your problems for another set of problems. Because you've got all your problems, but now there's no God to give any of those problems any sort of sense or meaning or could possibly sort them all out. Because there's just no God. You've just got problems now. And there's no chance now that any of these problems could be for your ultimate good. Or they could be undone and they could be serving good purposes to grow and deepen your character. Getting rid of God doesn't do any, anything. It doesn't make your problems any, any better. No, you have to slow down and allow, allow the word of God, allow the Bible 
to press God's love even deeper into your mind and into your heart. In fact, for a lot of people, of course, it's only when life starts to get a little bit difficult that we actually start to listen, start to think anyway. And perhaps very often that's what God is doing. He is creating circumstances, times in your life, so that you'll have to stop and actually have to listen to what he is saying to you. What he's saying to you, fundamentally, the Bible is one big message of, to the world of, I love you, isn't it? Think about this. What does God say to the Babylonian captives? This is remarkable. He says, 700 years... He says to them, 700 years before Jesus Christ, these servants of God, the true Israelites, who trusted God when he experienced his own exile in the Garden of Gethsemane and up on the cross. You see, he says in verse 16, God says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your, your walls, your city of Jerusalem was in it was destroyed. That was their problems. God's problems are ever before you. But you see, he says, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Now, that's a funny thing to say to the Israelites, isn't it? It's a funny thing to say to these captives in Babylon, 700 years before Christ, weeping by the rivers of Babylon. He doesn't say, OK, right, OK, you, you, you know, you think I've forgotten you. Let's take you out of here now so you know that I'm yours. No, he says, he says to them, no, you just stop right there. You stay there. Stay in your problems. Here's the answer. I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. Funny thing to say, especially since I understand it was a slave who would be the one to tattoo their master's name into their hands. Not the master doing any tattooing of any engraving anything into their hands. 700 years later, Jesus Christ, the servant of God, the person who speaks in verses 4 to 7, after he had entered a suffering, a pain, a distance from God, an exile from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a pain and experience that you and I could never experience if we trusted him. After he had risen from the dead, he said to his disciples, didn't he, in that room, he said, see my hands. See my hands. What do they see in his hands? They saw the scars of sacrifice, didn't they? The engraving of love in his hands. You see, here's the incredible thing about Isaiah's promise here. It wasn't just an illustration. Preachers love illustrations. You get a good one, you want to hold on to it and use it. It wasn't just an illustration. When our children were young, I wonder if they remember it. Martha is still young. We had, um, we had that book. We thought it must be around somewhere. That's a very, very sickly sentimental one. I love you to the moon and back. Did you read that one with the children ever? Um, I, you know, how does it go? I love you to the moon and back. You know, to sort of ex- ex- to, that's how much I love you. All the way to the moon and back again. Is that much is how much I love you. That's an illustration. That's a, that's a metaphor. We, you know, we can't get to the moon and back, can we? Us, you know, unless, you know, unless you're very, very exceptional. But here in Isaiah 49, chapter 49, verse 16, this picture is real. This metaphor comes true. And so when it feels like God is far away, well, Saying there is no God, atheism says that in your sense of pain, in your sense of pointlessness, your sense of deep anxiety, there's no God to care for for you. Other religions say there is a God out there and if you're good enough, he'll lift you out of your problems somehow or other. He'll get you out of your hole. Only Christianity says, only the Bible says, there is a God who is there. And he has come down quite literally in history to lift you out of the hole of your own making. Your separation from God that you deserve to bring you back, bring you right back to him forever, no matter how the circumstances seem now or in the future, no matter how hard life will be. That love, that love is cast iron. It's cast iron. It is guaranteed. And the people saw the evidence in his resurrected body and in the scars on his hands which spoke of his sacrifice on the cross 
in their place, suffering the wrath of God for them. So, do you know what the New Testament writers saw and understood by this? Like when Paul says, that's how they saw it. So when Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God shows his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. They saw and understood, those New Testament writers, that God's love for his people, for Christians, for the church, was ultra steady. It's good to know a steady person in your life, isn't it? You might have people who are up and down. But it's good to know steady people as well. God's love is ultra steady. He is ultra steady. You can't look at your circumstances and say, oh, God has forgotten me and God has forsaken me. Not while, not while ever those hands of Jesus Christ in heaven right now, still to this very day, carry those scars of sacrifice for you. You can't say that God has forgotten you. It might be difficult. It might be tough, but you never need to feel that he is a million miles away. You don't need to go elsewhere. You don't need to bury yourself in other things that will give you comfort and meaning and some sense of joy and boyfriends and girlfriends in alcohol and drugs in work in family and whatever it might be in doing the gardening and anything else to search for that meaning and ultimate ultimate meaning and purpose and love when it feels like god has left you what do you do what should you do what must you do personally Together as a church, as you care and love for each other, you go deeper. That's what you do. You go deeper. And you go and you meditate afresh again on the sacrifice of Christ for you on the cross. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Pray. And we can stand to sing. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your immense patience with us. Um, people who know your word, know your promises, who understand the cross and resurrection of your beloved Son and our Lord, and yet we still feel that you're far away. We still complain that you don't care about us. We still sometimes feel that things are completely out of control. We doubt you and we think that your word isn't reliable perhaps we would never say that but we might feel it oh we thank you and praise you for your patience with us you don't treat us ever as our sins deserve help us to grasp each and every one of us here tonight a fresh appreciation of the very depth of the love of the lord jesus indeed your love father in giving him up for us on that cross as he cried out father my god my god why have you forsaken me well, those terrible words to hear but we rejoice because we know that cry guarantees for us that it will never forsake us help us to press more deeply into your love and draw one another our brothers and sisters into that love as well, that we might know your peace, your joy, your help, and your comfort. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
that's it. Uh, thank you, Ian, for such a helpful and encouraging look at what it means to trust even in the hardest of times. Let me just end by reading verses 15 to 16, and then we have a moment of quiet meditating on them. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I shall not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Amen.